They call me deranged. The hope is that they are right. It is of no greater or lesser import for another fool to wander the earth. But if I am right, and science is wrong, then may the Lord God have mercy on mankind. These are the words of Victor Schauberger, a man born over 100 years ago into his role as a guardian of the earth. Among the magnificent Austrian forests, he grew up wanting only to become a forest warden like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and his father before him. But life was to take Victor far from the peace and solitude of great mountains and forests. Instead, he was to lead the struggle to preserve the earth, the forests and rivers, attacking the exploitation of nature as early as the 1920s. Nature was his teacher. Through an understanding of nature's principles, seen in the flowing motion of water, he gave the world a vision of how technology could be transformed to render free, non-polluting energy for our use. He warned of the consequences facing humanity if the present death-oriented technology continues. He died, betrayed by the same powers who promised to make his dreams a reality. Commercial gangsters who take all and give nothing back to the world. dies and with it a whole people perishes not a finger is lifted it is known that for the death of a people the death of a forest has preceded it all across our planet the forests are being destroyed at a frightening rate from the Amazon to Sumatra from Siberia to Australia from Alaska to California the great virgin forests are rapidly vanishing, the victims of logging, acid rain, and drought. Only 50 years ago, this part of California was a vast primeval redwood forest, truly paradise on earth. Today, less than 4% remains, and every day, more of these ancient giants are felled. Even our national parks are dying of atmospheric pollution. Soon, nothing of nature's beauty will remain for our children. It was in such a paradise that Victor Schauberger spent his childhood at home in the forest. Even the family motto, faithful to the silent forests, echoed the deep respect the forest wardens once held for the trees. From an early age, he was a keen and astute observer of nature. He learned directly from nature, closely studying the relationship between the earth, the trees, and water. But water, the lifeblood of the earth, became his consuming passion, and he set out to discover its laws and character, to learn the secrets of its power. Far from being merely an inorganic substance, Victor perceived water to be alive and with its own cycle of birth and transformation into higher forms of energy. He spent hours studying the flow of the natural waterways, how water moves in characteristic patterns, how water currents become stronger in the early hours of the morning when it is coolest, and particularly during full moon. He recalled the stories passed on from his ancestors who utilized their knowledge of water to transport logs down from the high forested mountains. They built constructions down the mountainsides which made the water flow in serpent-like spirals. I knew that my father transported hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of beechwood over long distances, never, however, during the day but at nights and generally when the moon shone. The reason for doing it this way, as my father often explained, was because water exposed to the sun's rays is tired and lazy 
and therefore curls up and sleeps. At night, however, and especially in moonlight, the water becomes fresh and lively and is able to support the logs of beech and silver fir, which are in fact heavier than water. By the end of the First World War, Victor became the Wildmeister for a large wilderness area of almost untouched forest. But his employer, an Austrian prince, had problems. He needed money. He needed a way to transport timber down from the remote forest lands. It was Victor who solved the problem of transportation, building water chutes or flumes based on his own observations of water flow and the knowledge of his ancestors. Through observing the movement of a water snake undulating through the dam beside him came the key to his success with the flumes. By imitating its movements, a combination of horizontal and vertical curves, the water chutes carried the heavy logs effortlessly. A patent for the artificial channel for transporting logs was granted in 1931. It enables heavy logs to slide through specially designed double concave channels without becoming jammed. Experts came from all over Europe to study the constructions and Victor was offered a position with the government. Ironically, it was the success of Victor's invention that opened up the previously inaccessible high mountain forests to commercial exploitation. He was forced to witness the brutal damage inflicted on the land he loved by short-sighted greed. He had observed how the streams reacted when the trees were cut down. When a mountain spring is deprived of its natural protective shade and exposed to direct sunlight, it dries up and does not begin to flow again until a shade is restored. Some mountain springs disappear, never to return. It is a fact that our supply of mountain water is shrinking as the protective forests are being thinned and cut down. When the mountain slopes are bare, rivers turn into thin trickles or dry up completely. Or when it rains, they become raging torrents bringing floods and devastation. The waterways become blocked with silt and debris, destroying the vitality of the water and choking the lifeblood of the earth. Combined with the damming and regulation of rivers, this begins the vicious cycle of drought and flood. Here's some soil from the forest floor, still underneath the trees. Very humus rich, it's a very alive soil. A type that can still sustain life. Here's soil that's left over from logging and general human habitation in the forest area here. You see it's very hard and stony. Nothing really grows in it here. Uh, except maybe some bracken ferns and what have you, um, maybe some desert plants. So you, what you see here is the actual changeover from the rich life of the forest to the desert that the people have brought to their activities. Victor fought for years against unnatural methods of water regulation. Another patent granted to him in 1929 was a construct for creating wild brooks and flow regulation. On the outside curve of the stream, concrete triangular structures are wedged into the soil to direct the water flow into the middle of the stream. Stones are placed on the opposite shore to protect it from erosion. Some of these ideas are now being used to try and save rivers and streams damaged by the effects of heavy logging. But back in the early 1920s, Victor's warnings fell on deaf ears. The large timber companies that sprang up everywhere, with encouragement from the state, had only one goal, the same goal they have today, to transform trees into money as quickly as possible. Angry and disillusioned, Victor resigned from his position 
and turned away to continue his explorations of the mysteries of water alone. Far back in history, there is evidence that men who have attempted to solve the riddle of water have been bitterly attacked. If the riddle surrounding the origins of water were solved, it would be possible to make as much pure water available as required in any location. In this way, vast areas of desert would become fertile. The concept of unrestricted production and cheap machine power is so revolutionary that the way of life all over the world would experience a change. As Victor carefully watched the flowing of water, the infinite patterns formed by its streaming, he became more and more aware of the significance of the vortex as nature's motion towards growth and life. The vortex, or spiral, is the underlying pattern which permeates our universe, a pattern formed by two opposing forces which is made visible in the substance of water. All life moves between two polarities. Without opposite poles, there can be no attraction and no repulsion. Without attraction and repulsion, there can be no movement. And without movement, no life. All that lives moves between an upward spiral toward growth and purification, or downwards through deterioration and degeneration towards death. But within nature, both forces always work in cooperation with each other. The form of motion which creates, develops, purifies, and grows is the harmonious hyperbolic spiral, the geometric spiral, which is the pattern of the galaxies in space, the basis of all planetary movement, the pattern underlying all forms of life the natural flow of water, of blood and sap. In nature, we always find an open system, never a return to the same condition, as the spiral clearly shows. The purifying power of the vortex revealed itself to Victor while sitting beside an Austrian lake on a hot summer day. Suddenly, he noticed with surprise that the water of the lake was beginning to move in peculiar spiral whirls. Tree trunks embedded in the sand were pulled loose and carried by the flow in a sort of spiral dance. As the speed of the circling water increased, they were drawn closer and faster toward the middle of the lake. Once they reached the center, the trunks tilted up and were sucked under with great force none of the trees resurfaced. Shortly afterward, the lake calmed down, but then the bottom of the lake started rumbling, and suddenly a spout as high as a house shot up out of its center with a thundering noise, spinning upon itself and overflowing from the top like a fountain. Then, just as suddenly, the spout collapsed, sending waves to splash against the shore. Victor had witnessed how a lake without fresh water coming into it can spontaneously renew itself through the power of the archetypal spiral. On another occasion, Victor was watching the spiraling flight of an eagle over a lake, suddenly dropping to be off with a fish in his talons. How he could catch fish without ever touching the water was a mystery. But as he watched, the eagle flew upwards describing an ever-decreasing spiral. What happened next was so unbelievable that Victor almost fell out of the tree. Fish in the lake were spiraling upward, just like the bird above. One after the other, like pearls on a string, they came closer to the surface. Because the spiral was becoming smaller, some of the fish were crowded together at the surface. A dark shadow fell over the spot a little flash, and the eagle took off with its prey. As he studied the mysterious qualities of water, Victor perceived it to be a substance which is alive, which is born from underground springs and develops to maturity. 
Its mysteries are similar to those of blood in the human body. Healthy blood is the carrier of life in the human organism, and living water plays the same role in the body of the earth. But when treated improperly or polluted, water loses its vitality and can die. It was clear to Victor that the continuation of life on earth depended totally on preserving the purity of our water. The natural course of water is a rhythmical meandering. This principle becomes manifest in all dimensions of flowing water, from the small trickle with its little rhythmical loops, through rivers whose loops grow ever larger, to the loops of the ocean currents surrounding the earth. As long as man had not disturbed the organic balance and Mother Earth was able to donate her blood, the water, to provide a healthy vegetation, there was no need to construct artificial canals since the earth had already provided waterways. Today, however, when water is diverted from its source, all of life is dependent upon stale, unhealthy water. It is desperately important to rediscover nature's ways if human beings, animals, and the land are to be saved from decline and the earth is not to die from thirst. The most convincing and obvious proof that life is gradually perishing can be found in the streams and rivers of our industrial areas, which are already so polluted that they are no longer rivers, but streaming sewers. Here, the Chicago River is not only a chemical cesspool, but its flow has been artificially reversed. As a result of such widespread pollution, our underground water, including most private wells, and the springs, which are the source of our water, are becoming contaminated and unfit to drink. They are now poisoning people, just as they have killed the fish, which only a few years ago used to splash in them. When Victor prophesied early this century that a bottle of water would soon be more expensive than wine, he was ridiculed by all the people around him. But drinking water is more expensive than gasoline today, and countless millions in the world are dependent on bottled water to survive. The droughts are getting worse. The underground water tables are falling lower than ever. Back in the early 1930s, Victor set to work to build a machine that would produce good drinking water artificially that would copy the natural processes of bubbling mountain spring water. His first plan for a water purifier developed into this egg-shaped apparatus for what became known as biosynthesis. In this process, small amounts of trace minerals and carbon dioxide are added to the water, which is then energized in darkness, set into a harmonious spiral motion by the specially shaped agitator. The dynamics of the water flow are simplified in this diagram. A cooling coil provides a temperature control and the vessel is enclosed in an insulating shell to contain the implosion energy within. The egg shape, another of nature's secrets, was chosen by Victor as a perfect form for a vortex chamber. An egg has a perfect curve for sustaining the momentum of a vortex within it. A central theme of Victor's thinking was a cycloid space curve observed in the motion of the planets as they orbit around the sun while at the same time spinning on their own axes. They move in open spirals or eggways as Victor called them. The spiral pipe incorporates this characteristic. It is conical and generally egg-shaped except for an inner bend which causes the water to roll inwards as shown in Victor's egg geometry. Word soon spread that Victor Schauberger could make living water, and people streamed to his home to try it with excellent results. He became known as the water magician. The vitality of water can be measured by its electrical potential. Every drop manifests an electromagnetic field, as does every body on Earth. The structure of moving water consists of layers, 
and from the outside layer towards the center there is an increased density and an increase in electrical potential. The naturally spiraling movement of water in rivers and streams builds up the electrical charge, but when water is forced to flow through rigid channels and metallic pipes, it short circuits and discharges its life force. Bacteria thrive in this medium, which is then treated chemically with the end result of water, which for all intents and purposes is dead. As we can no longer gain any life force from such devitalized water, Victor designed special spiral pipes to protect and preserve the living water. In this patent for the conduction of water, curved wedges are attached to the inside of pipes to direct the water into an inward spiral. Victor believed that the damage to water caused by our iron and concrete pipes leads to cancer and other illnesses so prevalent today. In this patent, a device is placed in the pipe or tube to create a vitalizing whirling motion of the water. In this patent, granted in 1958, the tube shown crosswise is egg-shaped with an inner bend and is wound in a spiral fashion to reduce the loss of flow speed. As he struggled with the problems involved in rejuvenating water, Victor was also deeply concerned with the principles behind modern technology, which is both incredibly wasteful and destructive, and which ultimately threatens all life on our planet. As mentioned earlier, there exist two forms of motion within nature, one that builds up and creates, and the other that breaks down and destroys. This depends on whether the driving force is centripetal, moving towards the center, or centrifugal, moving towards the outside. The centrifugal force leads to destruction, dissolution, and gravity. The centripetal force leads to growth, enrichment, and levity. The ancient symbol of the swastika expresses this dynamic dualism which is true on every level of manifestation. Thus we have spirit and matter, activity and passivity, life flow and life withdrawal, evolution and destruction, implosion or explosion. In nature, there is a continuous switch from one movement to the other. But if development is to occur, and the movement of growth must be predominant. Our technology recognizes only one type of motion, the centrifugal force, which leads to heat, combustion, and explosion through friction and pressure. Through concentrating on the destructive force of explosion technology, we see the breaking down and burning of our fossil fuels and other resources, the disintegration of our environment, and the ultimate manifestation of the death technology with nuclear reactors spewing out radioactive waste and other poisonous residues. Instead of nature becoming a garden of beautifully blossoming flowers, it becomes a filthy dirt heap of ugliness and death. On the other hand, the implosion technology of Victor Schauberger is creative, purifying, and constructive. The centripetal motion of the vortex is a suction force which creates an intense vacuum. It cools rather than heats and increases the electrical potential of the water. During hurricanes, twisters, and tornadoes, the same spiraling suction forces are at work and they can easily lift tons of seawater, whole buildings, or even railroad trains which lie in their path. Imagine what could be achieved if it were possible to produce them by mechanical means. Again, by imitating nature, Victor developed his suction turbine, or trout turbine, named after his observations of trout moving upstream against the current. The fish is a natural vortex machine. Its open mouth creates a vacuum which propels it forward, and by means of its gills and body shape, a vortex is created around its entire body. Victor described one occasion on a clear moonlit night 
when he watched a large trout move into a whirlpool at the foot of a waterfall. As he watched, the trout floated out of this vortex and up the waterfall, as if drawn by an invisible force. In his trout turbine, or implosion motor, water, or air, is guided through a vortex funnel and through specially designed spiral curved pipes toward a central point which forms a strong vortexian motion, condensing and cooling the water. In these pipes, the resultant suction reduces friction and a biological vacuum or negative pressure is created and energy is increased. Totally opposed to the plundering of fossil fuels such as oil from the earth, Victor had said his motor produces its own driving source through the diamagnetic use of water and air. It does not require any other fuel such as coal, oil, or uranium since it can produce its own energy by biological means in unlimited amounts, almost without cost. This power generator was claimed to have created a strong enough electrical field to light up the surroundings like bright daylight. In the Wasserfaden, or water thread experiment, originally carried out by Lord Kelvin, repeated by Victor and his son Walter, and now demonstrated publicly by Retta and Walter Baumgartner, the electrical potential of moving water is made visible to the onlooker. The electrical potential of a very fine stream of water is collected to produce sparks and light up a neon bulb. To understand the water thread experiment, let's take a look at this simple diagram. At the top, we have a water tank. It has two nozzles, allowing two streams of water to drop down into two bowls or buckets. That's the basic. Then inserted in that, first we have two copper disks, each one with a hole in the center to allow the stream to go through, and two copper plates, one in each bowl, receiving the stream at the bottom. The copper plate on one side is connected via copper wire to the copper disc on the other side and vice versa with no connection between the wires. When the streams start to flow, the first thing that's noticed is that the water begins to curve up and tries to reach back to the copper disc. That is, it takes on a levity function and goes counter to gravity. When this experiment is performed in the dark, if a neon bulb is put into the stream, contrary to known laws of electrostatics, it will light up. If a vacuum tube is connected either to the copper plate or the copper disc of either side, it will glow brightly, the brightness depending on the quality or liveliness of the water. If one touches the copper disc, they will certainly get a small shock. This experiment shows the levitational powers of a vortex in the egg shape. This is an egg on a string here, in a stream of water. And we see the egg's been sucked into the stream and actually rotates opposite to the stream, it's rotating upstream. Again, we'll see that it's sucked in. Online. Let us see again go in reverse to the flow. This same principle was used by Victor for experimental flying disks, which were successfully flown during his research in World War II. In the implosion motor, a diamagnetic field was developed which made the lifting power possible. On the 19th of February, 1945, near Prague, the first test of an unmanned flying disc took place. In three minutes, it climbed to a height of 15,000 meters and attained a horizontal speed of 2,200 kilometers per hour. It could hover motionless in the air 
and could fly as fast backwards as forwards. This flying disc had a diameter of 50 meters. Another model, based on Victor's prototype, was built by a German engineer, Hermann Klaas, in 1941, who reported, In all truth, this invention flew with almost unbelievable success. It climbed straight up into the air so suddenly that, unfortunately, it hit the workshop ceiling and crashed to the ground in pieces. In 1934, Hitler had specially requested to meet Victor and was well informed of his earlier work. Later, during the war, he was given the choice either to develop machines for the Third Reich or he would be hanged. Understandably, he chose the work, and during this time, the Flying Saucer Project was initiated. During this period, consideration was also given to biological submarine design. Victor was against using biotechnology for destructive purposes and probably never released his full designs to the Nazis. However, this may have given rise to the rumors later on that Hitler had escaped to South America in a flying saucer or submarine, that his death in the Berlin bunker was a fabrication. Whatever the truth, both the Russians and the Americans were highly interested in Victor's work. After the war, the Russians ransacked his apartment and then blew it up to prevent the Allies from gleaning any overlooked secrets. He was confined by the Americans in what was called protective custody for almost a year and was forbidden to take up any further research into the atomic energy fields. He had warned about the danger of nuclear power and called the splitting of the atom an offense against nature. With few resources left to him, Victor concentrated on agricultural problems. His work was devoted to increasing the Earth's vitality and to encourage the buildup and preservation of the insulating skin of the Earth. He condemned all kinds of artificial fertilizer, which exhausts the soil and upsets the delicate balance of nature. Victor had never turned his back on the ancient farming traditions. Rather, he enjoyed the company of old farmers and a simple country life. He had said, the old farmer was, for the clod of the earth, both its priest and doctor. In Schoberger's writings, he relates one ancient practice that had survived up to his time, and that was called the practice of clay singing. Uh, when Schoberger first heard about this, he went over to visit an old farmer, and he heard the farmers singing, and he thought the farmer had gone mad. He went and checked it out, and he saw him stirring just clear water in a barrel. Get stir, get a vortex going in one direction, then reverse it the other way and he would throw like little handfuls of loamy soil in every now and then. And on the counterclockwise stir, he would sing upscale from very deep bass up to high falsetto and then reverse that on the clockwise going downscale. And then this water was taken and sprayed with like a broom like this and it would be sprayed around on the land and allowed to dry. And this would leave like a very fine crystalline structure which would help charge up the land organically. This spade was based on Victor Schauberger's agricultural theories. It's a solid oak spade coated with copper. Now Victor noticed that with the decline of the ancient agricultural methods like the use of the wooden plow that there came a concomitant decrease in the fertility of the soil. 
the soil would dry out and not sustain life. Now, Victor discovered that this was due to the iron plows that were coming into use, cutting the magnetic lines of the earth, and it would, the earth would lose its charge, the water levels would drop. It was just generally detrimental to the plants. And Victor felt this was a serious problem that had to be looked into. And in his researches, he discovered that copper, when used on farming implements, greatly increased the fertility of the soil and allowed it to remain rich and moist and supportive of life. This patent for Victor's copper plow was granted in 1950. Many of these golden plows, as they became known, were manufactured, but pressure from the fertilizer industry halted their production. He also worked on this model for a spiral plow, which would move the earth in a centripetal motion, copying the work of a mole as it burrows underground. This type of implement opened up a whole new field of biological machinery for agriculture. But despite his wonderful discoveries, and with increasing bitterness, Victor realized that all of his attempts to alert the establishment to the breakdown of the ecological order were falling on deaf ears. He had fought all his life for the water, the forests, and the earth itself, but had in return been attacked, persecuted, and impoverished. His health was also failing. It was then that two Americans appeared and offered unlimited funds if he would travel to America and impart his knowledge for the good of humanity. Or so they said. Victor and his son were flown to Texas and taken to the solitude of the desert, far from his beloved forests and streams. There was no communication with the outside world. The post was censored. The funds never materialized, and Project Implosion, as it was called, became a nightmare experience. Finally, after being tricked into signing everything over to these men, Victor was permitted to return to Austria. Five days after he returned home, he died in despair, saying, They took everything from me. Everything. I don't even own myself. But his message of survival is more urgent than ever before. The only way left is a return to nature. Elements die, as men die, on account of the corruption in them. As water at its death, as it were, consumes and devours its own fruit, so does the earth its own fruits. Whatever is born from it returns to it again, is swallowed up and lost, just as the time past is swallowed up by yesterday's days and nights, the light or darkness of which we shall never see again. It is no weightier today than yesterday, not even by a single grain, and will, after a thousand years, be of the same weight still. As it gives forth, so in the same degree it consumes. The death of the water, however, is in its own proper element, and that great terminus and center of water, the sea, wherein the rivers and whatever else flows into it die and are consumed as wood in the fire. Rivers, indeed, are not the element of water, but the fruit of that element, which is the sea. From this they derive their origin, and in this they receive both their life and their death. 